get a great blessing. You can have the Word of God and get a great blessing. You can be um, there with your family, and it's a wonderful blessing. But there's one thing you can't get unless you go to the house of the Lord, and that's the presence of the Lord. And Jesus said that where you gather, I will be there in the midst. And so I'm just so grateful that each of you have come. And uh, in the next service, we hope for those that are online will say, you know what? I want to be there in presence. And so uh, we've been so excited about what the Lord's going to do. We're grateful for each that are here this morning in our Sunday school hour. And so uh, are we going to sing or are we just going to go right into the, okay, all right. <laughs> we want to give ten, plenty of time to our uh, guest here this morning. Normally we do a little song or maybe a few blessings, but it's been a great week. I'll tell you what, just so many amazing blessings here around the church and in the city here and our area. So thank the Lord. And we are so grateful for Tom and Joyce and Ben and Carmen that they would drive four days to get here just to be with us. And uh, thank you, man. We've been praying. <laughs> That's a long way from that other country out there. With Wow. Anyway, so uh, let's pray together. Uh, I'll introduce our evangelist, Tom Harmon, uh, in the next service a little more thoroughly. But I do want to say that I'm so grateful for uh, 40 years of ministry, preaching the blessed Word of God in some of the largest churches and conferences in all of America, greatly used man of God. And I don't know of anybody in the ministry who has the Word of God is more just down deep in his belly. You know, I mean, it's just way down there. And uh, that this man here, when you hear him, you, it just oozes out of him. And so I'm so thankful for that kind of a ministry because that's truly a Bible conference when you have a Bible preacher. And so what could be a better week? And thank you for coming early here and being here. Let's ask God to bless us as we meet together. Father, thank you for this time. I'm so grateful for this amazing church. God, far beyond anything I've ever imagined, Lord, you have done for us here. And Lord, in the future, is so bright. Thank you. Bright as the promises that you've given. Now, Lord, this morning, I pray for a special anointing, not just now, but each service. Lord, on uh, every person who serves, whether they're serving in nursery or the children's, whether they're, Lord, ushering or music, and of course, the preacher. God, we pray that you would just give us a wonderful week. Thank you for already answering prayer, bringing our special guests safely, helping them to be in good shape here this morning, Lord, to be able even to speak. Now, God, would you just give us ears to hear and a heart to receive, and God, make our feet and our hands do what we're challenged. Thank you for this ministry. We love you and praise you, and God, we give you all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And so I introduce to you our special guest, Evangelist Tom Harmon. <laughs> Don't you dare. Oh, it's good to see you. I've got to look you over for a few minutes. We feel so blessed to be with you. Thank you, Tim, for the opportunity really to come and be with you again. Joyce has one particular memory, maybe I'll share it with you sometime this week, uh, of this place. I don't know, we were here maybe in September, and it was hot. Okay, if this is a warm day in Michigan, okay, so this is right where we're at, okay. Um, but I was preaching in one of those rare instances where I got carried away and was preaching too long, okay, I was really, and then I made a joke that if... Uh, if I had a drink of water, I said, I'd keep preaching. And the next time we came, do you remember all the bottled water that was over there, just stacked around there? And I gave it to you. Then I preached about two hours after that. Uh, she remembers that. That was a, a good memory. We have good memories from being here with you. We really do. A sweet spirit. And just the whole, to look at this and think this is God's provision paid for, uh, that is to the glory of God. So, and obviously, you dear people know that. This is a great testimony, God's provision, his goodness, your 
faithfulness, hard work, and a multitude of other things that go into that. Um, well, let me see. I haven't looked at my notes yet. That's always dangerous. I'm just wandering right now. <clears throat> let me introduce my sweet wife, Joycey, this little silver-haired sweetie. We've been married for 51 and a half years or whatever it is now. And it doesn't seem possible, but it is. That's the way time just flies by. We have our firstborn son and his wife, Ben and Carmen Harmon, that is with us. And they were going to fly out with us. And as what happened is we were going to fly southwest. They started canceling flights and that kind of stuff. And uh, getting out of here was going to be the problem. That one was already canceled or something to that effect. So we love you, but we don't want to live here, okay? <laughs> We want to get back to Michigan. We've lived our whole life in Michigan, like some of you have lived your whole life here in California. We just lived all in Michigan. And uh, so we said, we're coming. We feel like God wants us here. And it was an absolutely excellent trip out. And Ben drove most of it, which makes it nice. We were chauffeured out here, okay? And uh, we actually had a little, we made such good time. We had a little time yesterday and saw some things coming down through... We were on four, whatever that is, coming through. It turned into a one-lane road. Okay, we didn't know that was in the mountain. We didn't know that was in California, to be honest with you. How many of you know when most people from Michigan think of California, what do they think of? L.A. or the San Francisco, you know, those places. I didn't know there was a place like this in California. In fact, I didn't know there were Christians. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, but... Do you know what I mean, how we stereotype? You, you've done that with Michigan, okay? This, the iceberg state, or whatever you want to call it. And so it, it's so refreshing to come here the first time and find people that just love the Word of God and love the same God I loved. And how many of you know that he is the same God in Africa, India, Russia? He's the same God, and we just thank God for that. And what a blessing to be here with you. Um, a, a real short on me... Uh, I guess the introduction covers that. Our family, uh, we, have, we have four children. They're all married grown, obviously. We have 22, great, 22 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. And number seven is going to be born in December. So uh, the great-grandchildren are really coming on. How do you know when you have great-grandchildren, you are an antique? Did you know that? <laughs> you know you're old when you have great-grandchildren. I never dreamed we'd live to see that, and it's happened. <clears throat> we have officially retired from itinerant preaching ministry. Notice I said itinerant, not preaching. I probably preached 100 times this year already, but I've not done the traveling. We've, we've done two churches, one church in September we were going to do, and this one. This We wanted to, we wanted to come here just because... We know we're going to leave better than what we were when we came. You people bless us. You give to us in, in many ways, and your smiles, your love for the Lord, and those things. It's just we're, we're ministered to. It's not always the case. And then we did a church in Arkansas in last month. And those are the only two places we are itinerant. We have a YouTube channel now. We're doing sermonettes for Christianettes. Okay, I, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Ten-minute sermons. We have our grandson this... He t tapes them, or no, Joyce, he taught Joyce how to run that camera. Now we have a light. We're, it's all in our living room, okay? And he says, Grandpa, you've got to make them shorter, make them shorter. And I got him down to 15 minutes. I said, I can't hardly get going in 15 minutes, you know? And then he said, no. He said, my generation, he said, they have the attention span of a goldfish. He said, 10 minutes. I'm not there yet, but we're working on that, okay? In fact, one of them are supposed to start airing this morning of a new series. And, uh, okay. And uh, enough of that. Now, I, after praying, say, God, what, do you, what would you have me to speak on a Sunday school hour? Uh, mixed group, and that's good. It really is. What would you have me to preach on? And I felt like the Lord <clears throat> impressed upon me, speak on identity, who we are in Christ. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> you obviously have the gospel as the foundation for that to launch into who you are. What do you mean by that? Uh, uh, your identity is when you receive Christ as your Savior, a number of things happen in your life. Quite a few things happen, and many of them are un unknown to you. You don't grow to a certain height, or 
you know, your complexion clear. It's not a physical thing so much as it is an internal identity thing. And then the rest of your life is spent bringing your behavior in line with your identity. You can't earn your identity by your behavior. In other words, if I sounded like an engine, does that make me a car? No. Some people think that they learn Christian language, it'll make them, no, that's not what makes you a Christian. So you understand, you've got to have an understanding of the gospel, which you, dear people, I know do, because you have a Bible-based group here. You know, you know what the Bible talks about the gospel. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's talking about growing up in Christ. Um, growing, not just growing old, growing up. Ephesians 4.15, 14 says this, that ye henceforth... I mean, it's present tense right now. That ye henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slate and cunning craftiness of man, who lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, that you may grow up into him. Listen, growing old is easy. So all you got to do is hang around. It happens. Okay? You just, you, you're going to find yourself old before you know it. It's just a, a hard... But a lot of people grow old and never grow up. You need to grow up. That's so why... As a baby, how do you know if you trust Christ as your Savior when you're 60, you start out a babe in Christ? Would you agree with that? And so now you have time to bring your behavior in line with your identity. Let me give you a couple more. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Ben is a big man. Okay, he's just big. He's like Joyce's brothers, big barrel-chested kind of... He, he's like her side of the family, her brothers. But how do you know that he wasn't that big when that little gal had him? Somebody say amen, would you please? Okay. Some woman say amen. <laughs> so it took him time to get to that place. It's the same thing in our Christian life. We start out, when you're born again, you're a babe in Christ. And then you begin to grow and mature and, and you... Bring your behavior in line with your identity. At one time, she nursed him. At one time, she fed him with a spoon, with a bib, and blah, blah, blah. If he, she was still doing that at this age, something would be wrong. And there's a lot of Christians that something's wrong. Man, you shouldn't be spoon-fed. You, you ought to be feeding others by this time and, and, and moving on your, your own journey of faith and your own walk of faith. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, <clears throat> When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, I thought as a child, understood as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. In our Christian journey, there's a time to say, I don't act like that anymore. I put those things away. That's a verse we use in our family consecration to bless our children, grandchildren, when they get to about 12 to 13 years of age, whatever the time in, and they've memorized a number of scriptures, and we question them as a family, and then we lay hands on them, different ones, as a, and we bless them. And we expect more out of them after, they're, after they've been through that than we did when they were little. You, have a, you, you should expect more of them to grow up. And, and, and yet, not thinking just because I've grown up and I can do these Christian things, that's what my Christianity is about. No, no, my Christianity is about Christ, what he did for me. And because of that, these are the way, this is the way I want to live. This is the behavior I want to bring in. Not because I do these things, I must be a Christian because I do these things. How have you ever met people that do not know the Lord, but they act more like Christians than some of the Christians you know? How have you followed what I just said? Something's wrong with that. If anything ought to mark us, it ought to be the way we behave because of what he's done for us. And we love him, and our life is not out of this legalistic, mandatory kind of behavior, but because of what he's done for us, I want to, I want to be who he's made me in Christ. I want to grow up in him. So that's what I want to talk about. Okay. July 11th. 1971, my identity changed. Joyce and I's identity changed. We had our first child, Ben. Did you know, now we've had four, we really had five. One's in heaven, God entrusted for him to us to raise. But how do you know that if we'd have had ten children, I would have not been any more a father than I did when I just had one. My identity changed with just one child. How many of you follow what I'm trying to say with that? Okay, how many times do you have to get saved? <laughs> you see, when I, you, you get saved, your identity changes. Now, how many of you know, I, I, I learned more about fathering. In fact, I know more about fathering today than when he was born. Somebody say amen if you understand that. How many of you know as parents, about the time you get them raised, you figure out how you were supposed to do it. Somebody say amen to that now. 
So you, you don't have it when you start out in that. But eventually, you'll learn some things about fathering, okay? Fathering a child is pretty easy. Being a father is not. Can you follow that trans? Fathering them. That's the fun part. Okay. <laughs> Ta-da! But now, identity. Being a father and knowing how to discipline, how to teach, correct, instruct, and all the things the Bible talks about as a, as a father I need to do with my children. Man, that's a learning curve. I mean, that's a... And as you still parent adult children... You may think you don't, but they're still looking at you, knowing they're going to be where you're at before they know it, and how we're supposed to do this. As you get older, you want to speak an ocean of truth and a drop of speech. Not the, not the other way around. How you can know that? You ought to say less the older you get. That's some of the wisdom of getting older. Joyce loves this verse. I preached some messages on it here a year or two ago. Uh, that the agent, um, it's Titus chapter 2, again, coming on the screen. But teach the things which become sound doctrine. That the aged men be sober minded. You know what that word means? Quiet. You just are quieter. In fact, I found I can say more by keeping my mouth shut. They already know what you're thinking. Say amen to that. <laughs> they already know what you're thinking, they already know your position on that. I need to preach that again. They heard that before. Just be quiet. Be sober-minded. Grave the gravity. How many of you know the older you get, the more, the more you realize how serious life is? It's just so frail and so many... Be grave. Temperate. You know what temperance is? It's restraining yourself. We have learned that we had our show and tell time. Let them have theirs now. Did any of you get that or not? Just different age. <laughs> and be sound in faith and love and patience. Just be sound in it. And the, like, and the aged women likewise. So women, everything he just said to the men, he's saying to you. Same thing. It's growing into this being a father. What that means. <clears throat> We're probably done at 10, 15. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> now, let me give you this one. <clears throat> uh, Ben's and Carmen's daughter, their firstborn, who just had a baby, August 13th, 14th, something like that. It was over consecration, I knew that, okay, because they were only up for a day and went back down. Her husband just graduated from the State Police Academy, Michigan State Trooper. And we got to go to that, and that was... See, I'd been a Michigan State Trooper for almost 11 years. And it was during that time in my life I got right with God. I'd been a State Trooper living for the devil the first five and a half years. Committed my life to Christ and began to grow up. Things changed. Couldn't swear, couldn't... I couldn't do some of the things that... How many of you know God's just going to flat out say, that ain't for you? Say amen to that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's just the same for you. You're, you're mine now, okay? <clears throat> and left me in for another five and a half, and I'm witnessing, carrying my Bible work, reading, handing out tracts. <laughs> Give it a ticket. See, here's the bad news. Here's the good news. You know, <laughs> it didn't always fly. People didn't always say, oh, thanks a lot. But, but I did some of that. Uh, <clears throat> but do you know what? Though I was a state trooper for almost 11 years, I was no more a state trooper identity-wise than the day I raised my hand, took my oath of office, and my wife pinned my badge on me from that day on. I, if you retire after 25 years, you know more identity-wise, but I can tell you this, you know a whole lot more about being and fulfilling that role 10 years down the road or 20 years down the road than you knew the day that you got that new identity. I remember my first day alone on the road. Um... When you graduate from the academy, they got you convinced you're the solution to the crime problem in America. Okay, so humor a young police officer. And uh, I was out. I finally, I'm working alone. I wanted to do that so bad. Not a senior officer overlooking me in the third district. You could do that. 
and a car went by, and the, the people just looked at me suspiciously, okay? And I thought, huh. So I turned on them. And as soon as I turned, they canned it, and they took off. I didn't know it was a stolen car. I didn't know, I didn't know a lot of the things that were in that car, okay? They just took off, and that's all I knew. So I'm big 440s, and I love the feed. So, just flying that thing, just going down the road. And you're supposed to, according to official orders, as... A seasoned trooper would do. You bump the post, say, I got one running on me, give the vehicle description, how many occupants, blah, 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 give all the course. I didn't do any of that. All I wanted to do was just catch them. I don't know what I was going to do, right up next to them or fine. <clears throat> and they took me, they got off on an exit, and they took, went down a road, went down a gravel road, and I'm driving, and dust, you can't see nothing. It's stupid to be driving like this, just stupid. But I'm. <laughs> and pretty soon, the road ended and went into a swamp, and they drove out into this swamp and bailed out, took off, run. There was four of them, and I just about went into the swamp, skidding on this grass and stuff. And I jump out, hey, come here! And I feel you right, and boom, they're taking off through this wooded, swampy area. So I went back to the post, and I said, I'd just been involved in a high speed chase. And I said, I gave them the vehicle description, the information on it, and where. And everything that I had, and then they said, uh, your location, 38387, your location. <laughs> 38387, your location. <laughs> I wish I'd have had that, and I just said, I don't know. Can you imagine what that sounded like over the airwaves? I don't know where I'm at. They said, well, where were you last you knew? <laughs> Oh, man, I told him, you know what? That never happened again to me. I learned something that day that I said I will never repeat again. I'm going to follow the official orders, and it's a whole lot safer for me if I do. Come on, would you agree with that? Did you get that? I'm going to stick with what this book says and do what I'm supposed to be doing because it's better for me. And I learned, I said, don't ever do that again. And so, by the way... After you've got about 10 years in, you've been had about all the experiences you're going to have, and you know what you're supposed to be doing. When a, Christian's been, when a person's been saved 10 years, they should know that I'm supposed to really be contributing now, not constantly have to be babysitted and those kinds of things and taken care of. I wish that were true of the American Christian church, but as a whole, it probably isn't. We just say, come feed me, come feed me, come feed me, when we should be saying, how can I feed others? How can I do some of those things? So, so, so with that in mind, that's, that's the foundation of this, what I'm going to talk about. Which identity do you want us to talk about? There's about a dozen of them. When you get saved, your identity changes. Did you know that you become a soldier of Jesus Christ when you get saved? You switch teams. The one who used to be your ally is now your enemy. Satan, you, you left from being a child of the devil, come on, help me, to being a child of God. You switch teams. And you, now you need to know who you are, because the devil's constantly telling you that you're defeated. But the scripture says you're more than a conqueror. How many of you are following this? So you take scripture and say, I choose to believe this is what God has said about me. Then how does a conqueror act? I'm, I'm not your punching bag anymore, Satan. You're not going to kick me around anymore like you used to with your lies and your temptations and your assaults and accusations and afflictions and stuff. You learn how to resist the devil and put him to flight. Say amen to that. And I'll leave that one alone. You see, that, that's one of the identities. Um, and you become a number of different things. You become a pilgrim. This is no longer my home. My citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is going to change this vile body, that it may be fashioned according to his glorious body. And you begin to embrace truths about who you are, what time and eternity. Um, we look not at the things that are perishing, <laughs> the things that are seen because they're perishing. We look at the things that are not seen, that are eternal. And that, you think, well, doesn't that just all happen in the moment? No. That's behavioral stuff that you bring truths from Scripture that said, this is what the Scripture says about me. Now, now do those things. Embrace it. You say, I can't do those things. Then go to Philippians 3 and tear it out. and say, Because this says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Good place for an amen. I don't pull this off. Of me. This is not something that I do by my self-effort, my self-energy, and those kinds of things. I do it because of the power of Christ that is at work in me. And there is no power that is greater in all the universe than the power of Christ. Amen. Christ liveth in me. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh, right here, in this meat and potatoes body of mine. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay. By the way, everything I just said to you, the devil will tell you the lie, just the opposite. Which one will you believe? Which will you believe? 
Well, soldiers, stewards, I no longer own everything. It really is owned by God. I just have been given the responsibility to manage it, to oversee it. I become a servant. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Jesus didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life. All those scriptures, you know what? I don't mind being called a servant of God. I just don't like being treated like one. Anybody follow that or not? <laughs> Servants have no rights, no wages, no appeal. Just got here to serve. I kind of, every once in a while, none of you have struggled with that. Okay, we'll move on to another one then. I'm a sojourner here. This is not my home. Um, there's a number of different, uh, a farmer, a husbandman, we're supposed to be farmers here that have patience for the fruit of the earth. We'd like to sow something one day and reap it the next. Nothing in creation does that. And yet we think we're supposed to pray one prayer, supposed to happen right now. Or are we supposed to endure in prayer and persevere in prayer, continue in prayer and watch in the same? Okay, the one I want to talk to you about this morning is saints. We're finally to the message. Here we go. Saints. Romans 1 verse 7 says this. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. The word saint in the Greek is hagios, and it means one who is without sin or holy. He's, calling, he's talking to the church at Rome, and he calls them saints. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God for you all. Thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. He prayed for the people that were saints. Identity-wise, had been made holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. What does that mean? My identity, when you get saved, to be made holy. Because we are told in Scripture, um, because he is holy, be holy, for I am holy. We're supposed to bring this unholy life of mine in line with who I really am positionally. If you get this one, I think the other ones <clears throat> are easy. To, oh, I see how that works. I see how that works. Holy. Let me read this one for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, listen to this, what he writes to this church in Corinth. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace be unto you, and peace from God <clears throat> our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church. How of you know he's not writing to the Chamber of Commerce? Say amen to that. He's writing to believers, people that have been born again, received Christ as their Savior, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Do any of you know what Paul deals with in the rest of this letter? <laughs> They're a mess. They're coming the drunk at the Lord's table. They're suing each other at court and law. There's gross immorality that even the heathen are not involved in. The, the unbelievers. Have you read that letter? I mean, kid, is it possible that people truly born again can act like people that are not? I think so. But that's not God's design nor his intention. We should bring our behavior in line with it. And so that's what this letter is. It's really a scathing rebuke of, it said, you stop doing these things and you start doing these things. You say, well, I just can't leave this. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, we can. In Christ, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Realizing these things are sin in my life. They're wrong. Don't you wish when you believed in Jesus, all your sin went away and you never struggled with it again? I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> you couldn't fit him in here this morning. Everybody wants that, right? It's a slugfest. Fight the good fight of faith. It just is. And it's a, it's a process of growing up and growing strong in the Lord. When I was weak, now I become strong in the Lord. Okay. How does one become holy? Is it by some meritorious behavior that I... Let me say this. I'll come back to this. I know where I'm at. How do you know that there are people without Christ that do not know the Lord, without religion, 
change their behavior. I know drunks that quit. I know drunks that quit drinking and never acknowledge the Lord for one moment. I know thieves that quit stealing and never. I know addicts that get clean and never call on God at all for bootstraps. It's amazing what the devil will even allow and applaud people to do in their own energy. That's not what I'm talking about. This is not this self-discipline. How do you know some people are more disciplined than others from the womb? They're born with that kind of drive and personality. Then man gets all the glory and it's not worth a biscuit in front of God. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that have been born again. How? Okay. Is a saint somebody who's been canonized by the Pope, 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 by uh, meritorious behavior? Is that what a saint is? No. There are people that did not know the Lord, that were not born again, that have been canonized. I can tell you that. Like, they're a saint now because we look back, and maybe they died, and eventually a, a new reigning pope looks at their life and says, I'm going to canonize. I'm going to say that person was a saint. By behavior? See, I have a sainthood standing before God based upon one thing, and it's a foundation that is sure, and it's all Christ. It's what he's done, not what I do. I, 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 know, I know some of you are saying, okay, I know that. I know that. Move on. I can't drum roll that enough. I just can't say that enough. It is not, it is Christ in me, it is not me. Not me for Christ to do these things. So if I do enough of these things, maybe he'll accept. No, no, no. you missed it. <clears throat> How does one become holy? Is it earned by my behavior or is it a gift? Is it a position that I receive because of faith in Jesus Christ? I think you know the answer to it. I'm going to give you some verses anyway. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We'd strut our stuff. God owes me. Look what I've done. No, you missed it. On my best day, I deserve hell in myself. In Christ, heaven bound. All him, in Christ. It's all is what he's done. It's a gift. <clears throat> Freely bestowed upon those who believe, for we are... His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, but not by them. So important to establish that. Not by good works, but unto them. I should, I should become a better person because of Christ than I would have without Christ. Simply said that I should. But my standing is not based upon what I should do, but what has been done. Let me give you another verse. 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Is that the one I want? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, that he, we might receive the forgiveness of sin, the remission of sins by faith that is in him. I'm not saying that right, and I'm going to go back. How many of you know when, when you don't, Remember how it's supposed to, you can always go back to where it's at. Somebody say amen to that, okay. I'm glad he gave us his written word, Romans 3. It was in here a little while ago. Well, here we go. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Well, where is boasting that it is excluded by what law? Faith? No. But by the law? By works, no, but by the law of faith. It is what God has done. Where is boasting? It's gone. I can't stand before God and say, look what I have done. I, de I deserve heaven. I deserve the blessings of being in Christ. Not one ounce of it can I do. Not one of it. it it's all, my boasting is in the Lord. Now, is that enough? You've, I think you got it. My favorite book, other than the Bible, is... By A.W. Tozer, Knowledge of the Holy. Small paperback, 100, 120 pages. It talks about the attributes of God. And we need to understand this. If I've been made holy and called to be holy, what that really means and what is the possibilities of that? Is it, am I hopelessly, helplessly never going to be able to do this? Or am I gonna, is this going to be something I can do? Okay. Um, knowledge of the Holy. 
we have some inherent knowledge or concept of certain attributes of God. This is what Tozer does. He takes about 15 attributes of God and he speaks on them. Real short chapters, but powerfully. We have some inherent concept of the love of God. Why? Because we, in a human sense, have an ability to love. How do you know that unbelievers do love their children? They love the uh, husbands and wife love each other. They do love each other. But it's the, it, with, if God did not enable humanity to have some measure of love, we'd have self-destructed long ago. We'd have never made it out of the Babylonian, it would have been over with. So people do have that ability to have that kind of love. So we have some, when people talk about God loving us, yeah, we have some inherent concept. When we say that God is merciful, we have some inherent concept. Every one of us knows something of mercy. When we could have dealt out justice, a change in our heart took place, and we were merciful. And so we understand the mercy of God. We understand um, justice of God. We understand the kindness of God. There's some of these things, the fruit of the Spirit, but there's also man has some inherent concept. When it comes to the holiness of God, Zero. We don't have any mental framework at all to process the holiness of God. So when he's told us to be holy, ah, I need clue. Now we're gonna, I'm going to try to tiptoe through this and give us something that will encourage us about the holiness of God and how he really sees me and how I look at my life and can judge things and say, holy, profane, wicked, holy. And you see the distinction. And God is saying, this is because of this. This is what I want you to do. I want you to move in this direction. Isaiah. When, no, I'm going to give you this one. Because we have no inherent concept of the holiness of God, Scripture helps us with some of that inability to comprehend. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, he's describing the holiness of God. He said, Who only hath immortality and dwelleth in the light which no man can approach, nor hath any man seen nor can see, now that's hard. We could preach, I could preach another hour on just that. It's not that we just haven't seen, it's we can't see this. We don't have an ability to see God as he is in this understanding of holiness. Paul said, when he's giving his testimony before Agrippa in Acts 26, he said, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven that was above the brightness of the sun. Now, we looked out of the cottage windows this morning as the sun was rising. Can I tell you something? I just looked at it for a second. I couldn't look at it, but just a millisecond, it was just almost blinding. What Paul is telling Agrippa about is God is above the bright, at midday, that's high, you go out and try to look at the sun and I'll squint your eyes at midday, at high noon. He said, the light that I saw in the way, I'm going to arrest Christians, the light I saw was above the brightness of the sun. You know what it did? It left scabs on his eyes. It fried him. We have a grandson that's a welder. And you don't weld without that. You flash your eyes. I've seen, I, I saw a guy one time. I said, man, what happened? Your eyes are all... He said, ah, and then he said, whatever they call it, art something. And he said, I thought I could just do it and didn't have my... Boom! Just in a second, it just fried his eyes. They were all red and bloodshot. The God we're talking about, and I don't want to do it carelessly in any way, is a God that apart from his grace, we couldn't begin to even look on. A holy God. A God that when we understand the holiness of God, there's an instant reverence or fear of God that comes. Man has no fear of God apart from this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Hmm. Moving right along. Isaiah. Holy moment. He knew it was in the year that King Uzziah died. He said, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled with tongues. Above it stood the seraphim, each having 
six wings, with two to fly and two to cover his feet. With two to cover his eye, with two to cover his feet, with two to fly. And the one cried to the other. These are unimaginable beings, these angels. You know what they're saying about God? Love, 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 mercy, mercy, mercy. We're all into those attributes. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. How did it affect him? He's getting a glimpse. He's getting just a glimpse and it's shielded. He's seeing angels around the throne. He says, the post of doors moved the voice of him who cried and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, you know what he said when he saw this? Boy, this is neat. I wish I had a video of this. That's not what he said. He said, woe is me. You know what woe is? It's like your intestines are being loose. The fear and the emotion is so overwhelming and you're just about ready to hit the deck. He said, woe is me for I am undone. For I am a man instantly convicted of who he was. Of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of uncleanness. For my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. And then God said, well, I got, I got this job. I need to be done. I'm looking for someone. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? When he got a glimpse of who he was, he said, here, my Lord, send me. You see, if we could get... To look at God has called us saints. The church are holy. Been made holy by him. I'm going to try to close with these. Boy, there's... How of you know we're not going to exhaust the subject of the holiness of God in a Sunday school class? Say amen to that. Okay. This is a, one of them... Kind of a glimpse. A reminder of things we already know. How of you know we need to be reminded of things we already know? Because God is going to say, you know what? Get a glimpse of who I am and then bring your behavior in line with me. Oh, if we were a holy people today, our nation would not be in the mess it is. Mm-hmm. How many of you can tell I'm revved up? I'm ready for the next service right now. This, this is going to be... Let me give you this verse. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 through 23. It says this, that he presents me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his son. Through the death of his son. Now I'll close with this one. How many of you can tell I'm eliminating some verses right now? It's okay. You already know them. Just good to hear him again. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, the book, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You know what that means, flesh and spirit? The outward stuff and the stuff nobody sees. How many of you know that I don't cuss and swear? I don't do a lot of the things that used to... I don't look at pornography anymore. I don't do the things that are overt, Okay. But I can tell you this, there's still sins that dwell quite comfortably in the dim regions of my darkened heart. And God says, I want you to deal with that. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart help me with it. Be acceptable in not, not your sight, in your sight. Can I tell you something? We get a bunch of people, your sight, oh, holy God. Holy, holy, holy. <clears throat> I want to close with this one. I I promise I will. I know you gave me the (laughs) sign. Luke is so good to help me in this. (laughs) Here it is. He says, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You don't create holiness. It's already there. He says, perfect it. It's like so many of the other attributes and things of God. He says, now I'm in you and you're in me. Perfect it. Mature it. Grow it. Groom it. Feed it. Two natures live within my breast. The one is foul, the other blessed. The one is love, the other hate. The one I feed will dominate. You may not realize how beneficial it is for you in your journey of faith just to be in a place like this this morning. Of all the places you could be, you'll benefit more in your spirit, the perfecting of holiness, by gathering together with the assembly of believers. There's accountability. There's a corporate fellowship and worship. There are benefits that are going on right now that you don't even realize you may be doing out of routine. It's a good routine. Who knows what God might say to someone in a day like this? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Heavenly Father, take this avalanche of disjointed thought. Coordinate it as only you can. Use it foundationally to help us in our journey of faith. Strengthen our faith, oh God. We know our foundation is sure. Because Christ, there's no other foundation. And I'm, I'm not talking to unbelievers. I'm not talking to believers. So much of your word is given to equip, equip us to be who we're supposed to be. So use something to stir us in our spirit, dear God, to help us in our journey of faith, that we might be conformed 
to the image of Jesus Christ. We've been predestined, we know your will for us, to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. And we'll be careful to thank you for what you have done, are doing, and will do, because you're the God who was and is and is to come. You cover all the bases of our journey. You are faithful. Bless our worship time, our singing and praising and giving and all the things that will go on. Every aspect of this ministry, of this day. And we'll be careful to praise you in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. 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 What a great start this morning.